Hi, this is Ed. You're here again on Global TV Talk Show. I'm broadcasting from the studio in Palm Desert, California, where yesterday it was like 109. The day before it was 114. But um, we're joined by people in so many different places here. This is great. Philip Berry and I have known each other a very long time. Philip, thank you very much for speaking again and for all of your uh, mentoring and guidance over the years and business. Uh, you uh, have deep experience as uh, managing HR and people, global HR with Colgate uh, in 60 countries. Why don't you give us a brief um, expose of that past career? And then I, uh, I want you to take a few minutes, please, as our opening keynote and talk about preparing local talent to be global leaders and get this turn of words now his present experience is preparing leaders to be global talent it's great language philip berry hi hi, hi everybody really glad uh, to to be with each and every one of you i i mean i i actually started my my global career when i was at procter and gamble and uh and was uh working in uh developing new organizations, uh, new organizational structures, uh, and also doing leadership development uh, throughout uh, the United States and also throughout LATAM at that time. Uh, and then uh, after other career moves that I have, I went to Kobe Palmolive, where I was the VP of HR for different international divisions. So at one time, I was the VP of uh, international development coverage. Uh, all of uh, all of Africa, all of Eastern Europe, and all of the Middle East, uh, you know, and then move, moved to <clears throat> to a position where I was uh, living in Europe as a VP of HR for all of uh, Colgate Europe in human resources, and then I had uh, Latin America had LATAM, you know, which included all of Latin America from as far south as uh, Chile and in Uruguay to throughout Central Europe and Costa Rica and Guatemala, uh, you know, every, Mexico, all, all the countries in between, including uh, the uh, Caribbean. And, and so when, when I think about my job as, as a, a global human resource person, my main job outside of uh, managing expatriates uh, doing executive compensation, uh, doing organizational development, uh, was also to ensure that global talent was available for the company. And, and so when I think about LATAM specifically, um, I played a very key role in, in helping to move local talent so that way they could be global leaders. And, and in fact, if I think about uh, right now, the, the president of of Colgate in the U.S. is, uh, you know, is from Colombia. You know, another person who is in Asia, you know, was uh, from Guatemala. Another person was, and I could go on with a few. If you looked on the on the organizational chart, what what you see is that there was a, a big move in place that we had to ensure that we didn't have people who were just designated to the regions or the countries that they were working in. I mean, which is what a number of companies do. They say, okay, well, I'm going to just prepare people so that they can run the operations in Peru or in Ecuador or in Guatemala. But what, what you want to do is to identify talent just like other parts of the a company develop. Uh, so that way they are mobile. Uh, and by, by to be mobile, then what we want to do is to one, develop a preparation plan for them. And so and, and and so I broke a number of barriers that existed where there was a feeling, uh, and a number of you will appreciate this, that well, if you're working in maybe one part of the world, uh, then maybe you can't work in another part of the world. Uh, and and so what we wanted to do was to break down those philosophical and organizational barriers. Uh, so that way people were prepared to be a global expatriate, you know, and meaning that they could move anywhere in the world 
you know, no matter who who they were. Uh, and, and and that's that's a challenge that many, as I was working with uh, my colleagues in a number of other companies, uh, international companies, uh, and, and there's a difference between just being an international company and a global company in my mind, because a global company means that you have human resources that can move anywhere uh, because you have prepared them so that way they could manage those those uh, positions, those uh, places. I, I'll give you one interesting thing with the, uh, uh, let me use in Central Europe, let me use Romania as an example. Uh, when, when the Berlin Wall came down, uh, in 1989, and so that was when I was the VP of Human Resources for the International Business Development Group. And so we were looking at how, in and throughout Russia, uh, Romania, Poland, Czech Republic, all of those places, we can move resources there. And so one of the things that we discovered, we looked at the similarities in the capabilities of people, let's, let's just say one, one country, Romania, you know, Romance language, right? You know, and so when you talk about Spanish, you know, people in Spain learning Romanian, much, much easier. You know, Hungary might be a little different, you know, because that's not a Romance language. But the other thing that we looked at was the marketplace itself. And so we said that what we want to do is to have individuals who are very expert in being able to manage uh, marketing and sales and development you know, in an emerging market situation, which is what Romania was. And so we said, well, where did we get those from? Well, we can go to Costa Rica and to, and to Guatemala easily and find people who are managing those environments very well. And we can move them over to a Romania so that way they can um, resource all of the functions at, at a high level of excellence. You know, and so, and it's something that, and, and so then what we did also was to have them to develop local talent, you know, in, in a very different way than they, than they would have been developed before, because in those countries, which were more in a command economy, as opposed to a market economy, um, the, they, in Russia is a, is a command economy. You know, and, and and so they don't have the type of skills and competencies, you know, in order to look at the marketplace in a different way. You know, and so that's why we brought people in who understood that. Another small example, and I'm just using Romania as a microcosm. When when we would go to the uh like R Romania, maybe Czech Republic, and, and you go, it used to be Czechoslovakia at that time, you look at the marketplace itself. So you go to like if you go to New York. You go to a store and you'll see people swishing you with perfume and everything as soon as you come in. They're, they're marketing, they're, they're demonstrating the products. That was not the case in Romania before. What happened was that individuals, you have products there on the shelf, you know, and people just saw themselves as, well, let me just put this on the counter. Let me put this on the counter. They weren't, they weren't selling things from their physical makeup. They weren't looking like individuals who really cared about the product, that they weren't smiling, you know, they weren't interfacing with the customer, you know, and so we brought people from Latam over who knew how to do that very well, so from Venezuela, for example, we brought them over there and to teach them how they can operate in a command economy in a very different way. So that's how you use global talent in order to move an emerging market situation so that it could be more of a developed quote unquote economy. Now, if you go to Romania now, you're gonna see it looks like, looks the, the paseos look somewhat like in Argentina. You know, I mean, it, it's like everything is, is decorated very nicely. The stores are very nice. The merchandising is set up very well. The people who are there are very good. And that enabled us to move that talent from like a Romania, you know, to another place in the world, you know, like uh, uh, down to Middle East or something, or, you know, to, uh, you know, anywhere, down to anywhere, South Africa or somewhere. But so so that that was the concentration that I did. And, and, and this is the other piece, and I'll stay short on this, so I'm not monopolizing. The, um, the important thing is developing a, an individual development plan for local people so that way we can begin to identify the type of projects and assignments that would make them global resources, that would enable them to manage more expansively 
in a, from a functional standpoint and from a business standpoint. And, and the other thing is that to develop their skills, like you, you look, many times people always say, well, let me hire a smart person. Well, IQ is not enough. In all of the work that I'm doing now with people, if you don't work with people so that way they are developing their EQ, their emotional intelligence, then they're not going to be impactful. But as a global resource, you need more than that. You have to go from IQ to EQ to CQ, which means that you have to develop their cultural capability, their cultural quotient. So that way, from an interpersonal standpoint, they understand what it's like when you're going from one country to another. You don't come like like Americans, matter of fact, sometimes Americans think, oh, well, I, or, or, Brit, or Brits, you know, I mean, also happy, see it there too. I, mean, I saw this certainly there over the 40, 50 years that I have been working in organizations. And they said, well, we can move them to a country and they can go anywhere. Well, what we want to do is to break down the fall fallacy, you know, that Americans and Brits can work any anywhere because if they don't have the cultural skills to relate to people, to build development, uh, to develop skills, to mentor, to give feedback, they're not going to be impactful. So anyway, so those are some of the things. That was my whole focus uh, on, on a global, from a local to a global basis. Philip, that's brilliant. Uh, so when we get into the discussion uh, cross panel here, uh, I want you to talk about what you're presently doing with mm. leadership development. Let's go to Madrid. Uh, Sergey, when you were with uh, AbV, with uh, Angela, you co-wrote a book of all about feedback, right? And that's what Philip was just stressing here, and engagement and feedback. How are you taking that forward now into your current new role? Uh, that's right. Can I just make sure that you can hear me well? Because my Zoom I hear is... you great. Okay, perfect, perfect. Yeah, yeah. You have a wonderful voice. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> indeed, um, the book is called Fair Talk: Three Steps to Powerful Feedback, and um, it's a primer on what a leader needs to know on how to give effective feedback and how to build a culture of feedback within their team, within their department. Uh, within their company. Right now, I'm using it everywhere. In my coaching, when I coach my clients and I need to give them feedback, I'm using the three-step model, which is tell me why it matters, tell me how I'm doing, tell me what I need to do different. Uh, and then they start using it with their people. Uh, the first step, tell me what why it matters. Very important. So often missed yeah, because we're all running we, we we skip over that but if you don't explain to people why they should care about what you're about to say why this why this matters to them why it's personally meaningful they're gonna just ignore what 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 you're gonna say the, the second step tell me how i'm doing well that's the typical meat of feedback but the third step that's future looking information that's uh, feed forward uh, that's what really gets people motivated um, and uh, energized because uh, it's no longer about what i did in the past it's about how i can be better in the future and uh, sticking to this routine sticking to, the, to this practice and doing it over and over works it's proven it's easy to do when you uh, when you've tried it and uh, and, and you've learned it and uh, now I use it in, in, my, in my programs, I use it in coaching, I use that uh, in, in consulting companies that want to uh, integrate it into their performance management practices, or if they want to strengthen their feedback uh, practices. So the why, W-H-Y, <laughs> is to give people an edge. And that's one of your basic underlying themes now, isn't it? You get the edge. The why creates meaning. The why connects. The why is at the center of everything that we do, why we get up in the morning. Unless you have a powerful why, don't expect from your people the what and the how. So that, 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 that's why Simon Sinek always starts with why. That's why 
powerful feedback will start with why. That's why all great companies start with the purpose, the, the why. The, the, the why today uh, must be at the center of um, all great company, great leadership, great products. Uh, we see, uh, we'll see more and more of that because, uh, we, and, and, and we see this rhetoric and it's uh, more than rhetoric. It's uh, really starts being um, the, the practice and, and the way of living and the way of doing business. Uh, we see this in, uh, in the purpose driven, the purpose centric uh, way of, uh, of, of management with the why at the center. Well, thank you for this. Let's go to Stephen Howard. Stephen, uh, you've written this book called Humany, H-U-M-O-N-Y, and it's it's hot. So <laughs> it, it's about a new way of management or is it just being more commonsensical? A bit of both, more, more way of leading rather than management. In fact, one of the things I say in the book is that uh, most leaders need to unlearn management, <clears throat> relearn to be human, and most importantly, learn to be people-centric. And uh, I want to play off of what Sergey was saying here um, a little bit, too, is that um, in the book, I kind of take feedback, and I take it I don't want to take, say, two steps further than Sergey, because I know he just gave us a brief a, a, a capsule of what, he, of what his book is about. But I focus in there, yeah, the why is important, but the impact to me is more important to explain to the employee what they're doing, what the impact is they're having, and what value do they bring, number one, give them what I call a clear line of value so they understand the value. And that's the why to them, not the corporate purpose, not the corporate why, but the individual why is where I would link my thinking with Sergey's. And then the um, with that is the impact they're having, how they're impacting the team, how they're impacting cross-functional teams, if they're doing, how they're impacting the customer uh, is as uh, equally as important as understanding the why, the purpose behind it. Uh, uh, Danielle, uh, would you please comment on all this? Of course. Well, it's for us to have leadership. It's it it started for us as I don't know having to have someone to answer to, and now we have to change this view. We have to be more. I, I will paraphrase Stephen on this, but we have to be more human on doing that. So it's a challenge. We are really used to do things the same way we did in the past. So that's. I would say it's a challenge, but we are evolving step by step. So in my opinion, we are, you know, in the process of making something new. And I think that's where we are right now, based on what Stephen said. Yeah. So is this the same? Um, I'm getting lost in my own words here, but are your colleagues doing the same kind of thing, using that same kind of an approach in uh, U.S. and in Europe? Danielle? I had to think. <laughs> 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 but the thing is, um, from my standpoint, I think that we are still changing. We still have lots and lots of room to grow. But at the same time, there is this appetite to change the things that we are doing right now. So I do believe that my colleagues in my counterparts, they do as I am. They are thinking. They are trying to find answers they are trying to find new ways to do the very same thing that we are doing about people so it's if i can say <laughs> thinking about it i can say we are in the middle of a process of change like we we are not changing yet but we are thinking about it because we are seeing the need of the need to do that you're in the philip, transition yeah, yeah. yes philip please yeah, no, you're in the transition state, and I, and I think that's that's important for organizations uh, to to realize that you're not, you know, it's, it's like uh, Alice in Wonderland. You you weren't the same that you were before, but now you're in you're you're not where you want to be, but you're different, you know, which is an important piece because what it, what it speaks to is being able to broaden the emphasis of why you know as as uh, Sergey uh, penned. Uh, uh, the the issue why why is this important you know and and if people can understand and then have a, a business and a personal reason for doing something differently then that is when they're going to be changed change doesn't come unless they see that happening that rationale 
So that's um, a good place to be. I, I maybe just a, a couple of examples uh, could have. I I'm, I'm thinking because early this year I sat down with a key talent uh, who was rough around the edges, a bit arrogant, um, it, too judgmental, talking down uh, to other people, and uh, very ambitious, very smart, um, hardworking. So I told her, do you want a career? Do you want accelerated career? Do you want opportunities? Do you want leadership development? Do you want to go abroad for an international assignment? Says yeah 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 yeah, so you're gonna cut this, you're gonna change, you're gonna be nice to people, and if that doesn't happen, you're not gonna get further than where you are now. That was her why, ambitious, career driven. That was the, the that was the hook. So that was what was necessary for her to start listening to my feedback. Another person uh, who was uh, very affiliation driven, wanted to belong. And for that was overly protective, overly um, immersing herself uh, uh, into what the team was doing, uh, always trying to help and as a result, micromanaging. I said, so, well, you care about others. You want to do the best for them. But in doing so, you're robbing them of opportunities to learn. You're robbing them of opportunities to make their mis uh, their own mistakes. You're robbing them of opportunities to shine on their own in, in their own right. Is that the caring leader that you want to be? A different case, a different why. Immediate change. So once you find that why, and once you hang your feedback on that emotive, powerful, personal hook. People listen, they change, they take, take action. Fascinating. Jorge, uh, as a leader of uh, several companies, um, advisor, mentor, coach, and many of them are women. Jorge, how are you yeah. managing that challenge? Well, it's just listen. Because if you talk the first, you you are not able to to comprehend some situation, in, especially in, in different countries, as is knowledge. But I, I think it's important to think that we are talking here like the why. The why is, is like a Socratic, a philosophy mentioned. I, I think so. So you, you can correct me if, if I'm wrong. Because you need to first answer why. Why do we need to this and when we work with with a lot of women, they they are very focused in so many things at the same time that you need to to approach them and say why we need to do this, why we need to prioritize it, and as I mentioned, Steve, like the the, the human, you need to be empathic with this the, those situation in each in each country that if. You don't answer that they are going to figure it out and prioritize and to make best approach for that way that she needs. I, I think you are lost like a leadership. Sometimes it's better to to be quiet and to conference to to hear them and after that realize what is priority, why would you need to move forward, and what is the strategy for the best for all the company. Yeah. Okay. Great. So the personalities of the different people, uh, the, many of them are uh, financially successful um, outside of LARM and uh, with longstanding status within their local communities. Uh, so it's quite a collection of people. And uh, I'm impressed that the organization has developed, the industry, the relocation industry has developed, and LARM has been an integral part of that. And to what extent are you using technology to communicate and manage relocations? I want to make sure that you know the quality of what 
my friend James Moss is doing uh, with his new product. Uh, so, James, do you want to step in here? Uh, yeah, sure. I'd love, love to just... Uh, it's a fascinating discussion, by the way. And I think the, the whole talent piece of, you know, what motivates people and, and why they... You know why they go ahead and they they do things very positively or not. I I think it's really important. Um, <clears throat> I I think the the whole thing about people is it is a people business. I think relocation, managing people is all about you know the sort of uh, the psychology of it. Um, and I think technology is 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 really interesting because technology is an incredibly powerful tool. I mean, obviously stating the obvious here. But the, the thing about technology is that it, it, it mustn't lose sight of the people side of the equation. And um, I, and I think the, the overlay on that is that there has been a, a major generational shift. It's, it's been around for a while um, with millennials and our Generation Z. And talent has changed. It works differently. From you know my generation and, and and some of the panels here, and you know we in, in my response to that was moving to a mobile phone app approach because the 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 the, the people we work with uh, you know people who sort of relocate on lump sum or SMEs or self movers work very differently from the way that my father did, for instance, when he was, uh, he worked with Xerox Corporation for about 20 years. And it's it's a whole shift. Um, the, the model for today's generation who work off mobile phones, who've text often, I, I like the, the reference to Simon Sinek earlier on, because uh, he's, he's a really interesting guy, but he sort of reflects that change of talent. And I think a lot of it is 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 managers and getting their and, and HR and mobility, getting their head around that. Um, what we do is we sort of assume that people sort of know what they want to do and where they want to go. They just need that extra bit of help to get there and to sort it out. It's not a, a red carpet scenario, but people are very independent. They have a lot of tools at their disposal these days. And technology can be super efficient can also be super cost effective. I mean, you can save a fortune if you use tech sensibly. But basically, it's, it's understanding your customer, um, it's understanding the user, um, it's understanding your talent. And I think why feeds into that really well. And I think that's the challenge for all of us. Stephen. It's all, it is. It's all about people. I mean, it's, it's you know, every business is a people business. You know, it amazes me when I start, you know, doing sales training with people and they talk about, well, we sell to this organization, we sell to that organization. No, you don't. You sell to people in that organization. Yeah. You sell to people in the other organization. Yeah, you don't, you don't make a sale with Xerox or IBM or anybody else. You make a sale with the people at those organizations. So uh, I totally support what James says. And, you know, that's the focus of humany. Humany is a word I created and it combines human, humanity, and harmony. And it talks about, uh, the, emphasizes the need for leaders to create workplaces of well-being and harmony. And you know, people laugh at me when I talk about harmony in the workplace. They say there's no such thing, but there can be. In in some organizations, there is. Stephen, uh, you've recently been on uh, many other programs, just not mine, and you've been in front of large groups now talking about what you just said. How have you been impacted from this experience of being invited and welcomed um, to say these things that you spent months creating in, for this book? And But these are things that you've all, always done in your own practice. And now you're out there being uh, applauded for doing what probably seems pretty obvious to you. Well, thank you, Ed. And by the way, you are my favorite show, so don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, it's not about me. It's about the message. And I keep emphasizing that to people. I mean, it, it's, uh, I enjoy it. I, you know, I, I enjoy the fact that people, the message is resonating with people uh, in everything from small organizations on into large organizations, even associations. I, uh, 
I spoke uh, last week at the National Association of Home Builders uh, event in Cincinnati. And so that's an association of, of, uh, of people, not a, not a company, so to speak, although they're a very large organization themselves. They have over 300 employees, I think. But um, yeah, I'm just pleased that people are, re it resonates with them. Um, and, you know, personally, it, uh, it's, it has satisfaction. That's all I can say. But it's not about me. It's about the message. Okay, back to Philip. Uh, Philip is the author of a book called uh, Being Better Than You Believe. Uh, I hope I didn't screw that up, Philip. No, that's right. Being Better Than You Believe, Eight Steps to Ultimate Success. Yeah, and that was written a long time ago, but it's it's still real. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I get a lot of resonance from it, um, you know, even now uh, with a number of people um, who... I'm coaching, in fact, or people in organizations. And really what I focus on now, a lot of my focus now is on helping people to fortify their personal brand, you know, in terms of understanding. Of, and and this, is, this is something that has to do with uh, clarifying their why, you know, and, and then you want to think about where, you know, and how, and when, what do I need in order to do in order to make that happen? And and I'm fine. I find, especially as I am working with people who are at a leadership level, who are looking at uh, a new way of positioning themselves, it, it, it carries a lot of weight in that in that area. Uh, for in terms of they they haven't really taken the time to identify what their what their personal brand is and uh, who who are they right now? What what all of the experiences that they've been to been through what does that make them able to do now yeah and and also uh i think it's uh it helps them to think about what they can do tomorrow matter of fact i was just before this session i was talking with a person who is a, a chief operating officer in an organization and she is trying to think about well should i be a coo should i be a, C be a ceo yeah and so i i'm working with that and on this. let's let's talk about what you're who you are you know all of the things that you've been through you know the, your, your all of your graduate education all of your international experience you know what what and, and then you think about your life cycle i mean i'm at a point especially leaders now when you're at uh when you're beyond 55 years old uh one needs to think about well how am i going to live the back nine of my life the next 10 years, <laughs> what contribution am I going to make and where am I going to make it and how am I going to put that together? You know, so, so I wind up going back to this ground zero with people to identify those, those pieces. And it's really enlightening. You would think that a number of them already have it all figured out and they don't. Um, you know, and, that's, and that's the benefit that I bring to them in terms of that situation. I mean, I have another client. Who has a, who's a lawyer who is very well established in a business that he has, and and so he's saying I want to do something else. Um, I I want to be able to you know I'm, I'm not going to develop another type of business in another country. And in fact, uh, you know he already has made some uh, as we outline a strategy. You know he has made some great inroads into this new business, which will double you know some of the millions that he already has in place so i so that's the type of that that's the type of enlightening conversations that i have now because a uh, number of people when you're younger in your in your career then you're just saying well how am i going to move up in the organization but what we want to do is to look at how we make leaders global talent so that way they can think that's the phrase where i talk about how can leaders be global talent there there's a way for them to do that uh, and however, they have to increase their CQ for sure. Uh, so that way they understand what other markets are available, what other products, what other services. They understand more about the competition and they understand how they fit in. You know, so so what I'm doing really when I'm when I'm helping individuals on an individual basis, I'm helping them think about the whole piece from a strategy. You know, personal branding is not just a nice to do uh, type of uh, exercise. It's a strategic effort that individuals have to engage in, in in order to increase their wherewithal. 
Thank you, Philip. Uh, it's brilliant. Let's go back to Danielle. Danielle, do you provide coaching, mentoring to the transferees so that they perform better and grow as people yes. while on assignments? Well, that's a challenge, I think. The first cost to be cut for mobility <laughs> normally is cultural training and coaching and this kind of thing. Well, so that's tra that's, that's tragic, tragic, huh? Tragic. Yeah, that's, that's a shame. That's a shame. Uh, but here we do have support, internal support, and we do see that is important for everyone moving to another country to at least have the basics in uh, cultural, well, the cultural basic knowledge for you to go to another country to have a lesser impact. Uh, of course, there's if the, if the, there is the need of something more, uh, more deep in order to assist that we do have ways to provide it but normally in a in a baseline we can do we can provide that internally and we see that in a whole new level because people have to have uh, has experienced uh, less of uh, of a big impact we do have cases of where we need to intervene where we need to have like a, a, a external coach because internal one doesn't work that good because people don't believe in, in the company to do that they have to hire someone uh locally or to hire someone for another company but we do see the good impact of that uh, in brazil specifically specifically i have two companies that assist me really great with this kind of service uh, and I think it would be mandatory. That's why uh, when I see when I see companies cutting off this kind of support, it's a, really a shame because it makes the process better every time it happens. Yeah. So, Stephen, can you advise Danielle on how perhaps to uh, <laughs> not enlarge his thinking? Of course not. But um, but just a, another cue, you know, what's a what's a transition uh, like a yellow brick road pathway to achieving something that the company is not willing to support? Well, I don't know about other coaches. I, I actually um, I have a couple of people I'm coaching that are paying for it themselves. And unfortunately for the organizations, Danielle, both of these people are going to leave their organizations in the near future uh, and go somewhere else because, and I actually give them a discount. I, I kind of admire people who are going to invest in themselves. So I give them about a 25% discount on my coaching fee. Um, what I would recommend to Danielle though, is find a, find a coach um, who can work with more than one people in your organization and give you a bulk package. I, I have a client in California that I work with and I'm coaching six different people in their organization. And obviously I've given them a, a really good price understanding, you know, we started this during the pandemic. And so it continues now. I've, I've just kept my, my, my fee flat for them. Uh, and I think they're going to add another person on next month. Uh, so find somebody who, who can give you some kind of a bulk package for, you know, coaching four or five or six people at one time. Um, that, and that works very well. So that, that may be the yellow brick road for you. The other might be, you know, if they pay for it themselves, just try and figure a way to reimburse them for that. <laughs> that, that, that that's interesting. Orge, are you using coaches? Currently, uh, no, because we have uh, a lot of, uh, well, we use coaches for our clients, but not internally right now because we have a lot a lot of experience with our directors in each country that they coach in their teams, and but we're not, we're currently not outsourcing that kind of coaches. But I, I think we, we can, we need it in, in the next future. Yeah. So what do you see with the growth of uh, Chinese companies uh, and, uh, you know, coming into Latin America? Uh, are you um, into that? Um, are you just watching from the side? No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we need to, to be always aware about the, the, the transition and the investment. And the Chinese one is one of the most important in Latin America because they, they have a lot of investment in infrastructure and public chains and other stuff like technology, especially in, in this network about telephone. But in fact, it's, it's very interesting because 
each country is very different, but when you figure it out that they can work together, it's like the same. You, it, it's very interesting because Latin America is very dynamic. And when you receive some person from Asia, Europe, you explain it why we, 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 we are, uh, we, how we manage all this situation through the economic or, or society. It's very fun and they they love Latin America. They they decide to to stay here and grow this business and make it make it more 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 achievement for their company. Yeah, thank you very much for sharing that information. So uh, I have a friend here uh, in San Diego that uh, recently visited an old friend in Uruguay. And he came back and, he, and so we were having drinks and he, he was saying just how wonderful Uruguay yeah. is. Yeah. And, you know, most people don't know anything about that area. Yesterday I was talking about about the, this kind of different of the, each each culture than the Uruguayan people is so nice that you think about you think sometimes that there there is a trick because they are so nice they are so kind they are always open arms to 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 help you as a foreign or something that it, it's very interesting and Uruguay in fact. Uh, it's our little country, but it's always a great heart to to receive all the friends who want to live, to want to visit, and whatever you want to do in Uruguay. So it'll be a good place to buy real estate. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and they and they have a great immigration structure for that. <laughs> Yeah, Philip, you, you're smiling there. Do you do you have personal experience in that country? Oh yeah, no, I've been to all the Montevideo. I mean, you know, I I, I love all, all the little. I've been to every one of the countries in in throughout Latam except for Bolivia and Paraguay. I've visited all of the other ones, uh, and uh, you know, it's just so much richness. When when Jorge talks about the richness of the the people and and visiting there, uh, you know, it's one of the things. I and I and I'm still. I have great connections still um, with a number of friends uh, who who are there, who uh, who are improving and making the difference and paving the way with uh, new insights. <laughs> this is great, <laughs> Sergey. Um, so, when you were um, based in Irvine and had responsibility with Abby for Latin America. Uh, it was sort of an integration because of the new acquisitions, right? And then, you know, getting them to do their own thing, but to do it the AbV way. I would say that it was an integration and not necessarily one over the other, but uh, finding ways on uh, how to merge the two cultures because, um, for those of you who um, are un unfamiliar with, with the situation, uh, back in 2020, Avi, a large pharmaceutical company, bought Allergan, um, um, that is most known for its brands like Botox or Juvederm, uh, so um, uh, fa facial aesthetics. Uh, uh, they have very different business models. Uh, Allergan is very much uh, has uh, direct interaction with the with, with the doctor. It's very similar. It's it's more similar to FMCG than the traditional pharma. So bringing them too close together would have been disastrous. It it it, it would uh, have created a monster, not good either for uh, one nor for the other. So uh, up until today, uh, both companies operate. Uh, uh, sort of uh, independently when it comes to the business model. So cultural integration, but keeping business models separately. And that's what uh, our efforts were targeted at. And uh, I believe that we did a fantastic job in making that happen. Well, way to go. Philip, what do you have to say about that? 
Yeah, I was wondering because when one of the things that I found in looking at companies who are based in different parts of of uh, Latam, you know, the the integration of people, you know, northern part, northern cone of, uh, you know, the uh, the continent ver versus, uh, you know, southern, you know, and and the integration from a cultural standpoint is extremely important. And one of the one of the reasons why many acquisitions actually fail, not only in Latin, anywhere, you know, is because they don't have that cultural integration. You know, that is understanding the, the values, the style, the skills, and the sensitivity of, of people. If, if they don't have that, the, the, then if they aren't able to communicate or if they carry an unconscious bias that keeps them from connecting with people in a more affirmative, inclusive manner, then from a business standpoint, they, they will fail. And, and, and that's why, matter of fact, uh, you know, you look at some of the great mergers that have come about where uh, Daimler Benz with Chrysler. And the reason why it failed is because, you know, the lack of cultural integration there. It wasn't because they didn't have smart people. They had smart people. They had great products. What they didn't have is the understanding of how to work together a as a team, you know, and and and, a and have a we system as opposed to a me uh, dominating things. Interesting. Stephen, uh, we're coming to a close here uh, in the next five minutes or so. I invite you and everybody here to come back on Global TV in coming months, and we can continue this discussion and bring in some other people, including women. <laughs> but uh, uh, Stephen, what do you have on tap for September? Uh, well, September starts tomorrow, believe it or not. And on tap, I'm actually, um, as a result of this show, I'm giving a workshop tomorrow in Mexico City to a relocation company about oh. human leadership. Oh, so okay. thank you very right. much. So, uh, uh, great. Probably why some right. of them aren't on the show today. They're probably in the air traveling from various places. So uh, that's on tap. I'm also uh, speaking at a uh, leadership conference virtually in mid-September. And uh, I, hopefully I'm writing a little bit. I haven't written in three weeks. So I've got to get back to writing. Yeah, you're, yeah. you're a slacker. I'm like, how many books do you have? Like about 10? <laughs> you're slacker. Uh, actually, Philip, I have 22. But, oh, I'm uh, sorry. <laughs> well, but I'm working, I'm working on 23, 24, and 25, which may be my problem. I need to focus on one of them, not all three. <laughs> Why don't you just, uh, if you don't mind using this platform to reiterate your formula for writing, uh, the four by four thing? Four or... by four? Oh, it's, it's stuck with you. You're going to write a book someday, I know. Oh, well, yes, I am. But uh, four by four, <laughs> The four by four works for, for me, the people I coach, and I'm actually working with a lady in Suriname, believe it or not, helping her publish her book. It's a straightforward format is sit down, and come up, what are your four main messages that you want your book to convey? And this is for nonfiction. So what are your four main messages? So let's say it was about feedback. Um, it, you know, you might talk about the, the feedback process. You might talk about, uh, you know, positive feedback and negative feedback, whatever you want to call it. Then for each of those four messages, whatever your key messages are, uh, you have four key points that, that substantiate that. And that gives you 16 chapters. So four sections of the book, four main messages, with each one having four supporting messages. And that's how I have people outline their book. Uh, it never ends up that way. I mean, my, my human leadership, I think, is 17 chapters. The book before that, I think, was 18. It will change during the writing and editing process. But this is my formula for getting people to get their thoughts down and get a structured process so they can start writing. Great so. thought. Thanks. So. All right. And this is recorded for the whole world. <laughs> so. Yeah, well, I just lost my trademark, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, don't, they don't know what's in your body, though. They It's in your mind. They, they, they can never figure that all out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. So thank you all for being on Global TV Talk Show. Have a really good evening and That's day. And, and let's do this again. I enjoyed it and yeah. learned a lot. Yeah. Much more than I thought I would learn an hour ago. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Good day when you learn something. No, thank you. <laughs> okay. So, so take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.
Bye.